Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Chapter 6 Unexpected System Ping Minus 5 Alex hadn't expected anything interesting to happen until his meeting with Stain. Even then, that was more because of his future as the villain of Iron Man 1 than anything else. That expectation had been dashed when, suddenly his worthless system pinged him out of nowhere. Ding. Congratulations to Host for containing yet another SCP. As this is the first SCP that the Foundation has successfully contained without Host, Host is granted a reward. Ding. Host is rewarded with one Foundation Special Combat Unit of 20 Class A Combat Personnel and 100 Class B Combat Personnel. He quickly dismissed the notification and looked at the Foundation database, sure enough, a new entry had been added by Site 644. Some piece of alien tech? They gave it a safe class classification, so I guess it's not a big deal. At least I don't remember this thing from any of the movies or shows. Not that I ever saw anything but the biggest films. Alex thought and felt a bit depressed at the end as he regretted not watching more Marvel stuff. Sure, he had watched the big popular films and some re-recaps of some other stuff with a few theories on YouTube. That still left a lot of blanks, given how much they had been pushing out before his transmigration. Shaking his head, Alex dismissed the entry and was about to return to his work when a thought popped up, making him pause. System, did that give me any points? Ding. Host was rewarded with 200 points for the successful containment of the safe class SCP. I had hoped that would indeed be the case. Now I got next month covered, and I can start putting some more plans into motion. Alex whispered with a slight smile on his lips as he started to make plans for getting his hands on more points by handling Marvel SCPs. Dash. The following morning, while Alex perused the newspaper at breakfast, an attendant reminded him, Please remember your lunch meeting with Mr. Stain today, sir. Yes, I remember. Also, send a team to San Juan to investigate a lead on an SCP object beneath the city. Alex replied smoothly, initiating the search for the Cree city. Despite his limited knowledge of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. plots, he felt any intervention would be inconsequential in the grand scheme. Should we construct a containment facility? Inquired another subordinate. A class 2 or 3 facility might be needed. It might be Euclid or even Keto class and shouldn't be highly dangerous, but containing it could be difficult given its size and location. I will have what I know sent out to whatever team is put in charge. A team will depart within the hour, the subordinate confirmed, exiting to make the necessary arrangements. This will be a good first major challenge for the Foundation, to handle an entire underground city right under a major city without letting S.H.I.E.L.D. know. Alex thought as he finished his breakfast before returning to his bunker to write up the entry. SCP-12555 Object Class, Pending Special Containment Procedures, Pending Description, believed to be an extensive underground alien facility, possibly Cree, with undetermined defensive capabilities. Recommends using Class D personnel for initial exploration. Addendum 01, by order of 051, the use of 1000 Class D personnel has been approved. After completing the entry, which was sparse in details, Alex reflected on the likelihood of fatalities in exploring the city. To think I've just potentially sentenced a thousand people to death. Transmigration really changes one's perspective, he whispered in the silent room, shaking off the thought to focus on work before meeting Stain. Dash. With Obadiah Stain. Obadiah looked at the young man in front of him. His pitch black suit, short blonde hair, and bright blue eyes made him look like a rich, pretty boy. But he knew that this person was nothing like his own Tony. I only just started selling weapons to those Ten Rings guys, and then the head of the Ritchie family wants to meet me? I have a bad feeling about this. Obadiah couldn't help but let his thoughts run wild as he sat before the Alexander Overkill Ritchie. Taking a sip of his water to wet his dry mouth, Obadiah gave the man in front of him a weak smile before breaking the silence. So what can I do for you, 
Mr. Ritchie. Obadiah might act like a big deal in front of others, but he still had to give some respect to the person in front of him. Since starting to sell weapons on the black market a few years back, he had learned a lot of things. For one, he had gotten a whole new respect for Tony's genius. The damn boy might be trouble at times, but he was a goose laying golden eggs. After selling the first few batches of weapons, the military came knocking, not to find him but to find Tony. They wanted newer, better weapons since their enemies had gotten their hands on the same stuff they used. Another thing he learned was that he had started at a good time, just as the Ten Rings were in the middle of expanding. He also learned a lot about people he had never known before. Just like Alexander Ritchie here. He might look like a harmless youth, but both of those were lies. How in the world can he continue to look so young? He is older than Tony, if not older than me. Obadiah cursed in his heart. The Ritchie family had been one of the big surprises. He had known of them even before entering the black weapons market. The Ritchie were the number one force to launder money in the States, he had used them before, as had just about everyone that could skim the book enough that they needed to clean money. That was just a new side business started by the current head, this Alexander in front of him. The Ritchie family had another title, Drug Kings of Europe. At least 80% of all drugs entering that whole continent came there through the Ritchie family. And they were still expanding. Their most concerning title was overkill since while others might send a hitman in the dark, the Ritchie would send a rocket through your office window in broad daylight. Yes, Mr. Stein, I wanted to discuss business with you. The folder, Alex said, and an attendant handed Obadiah a thin folder. You want nuclear weapons? Obadiah couldn't help but exclaim out loudly as he read the file. It read like a shopping list of weapons of doom as they were all the most dangerous and powerful weapons made by the Stark industry and mankind. Not just buying them either, even just the key components as well? Even a man like Obadiah felt his heart hammering, and his mouth go dry at the idea of a criminal wanting stuff like this, not to mention the amounts. That is right, Mr. Stain. I recently got my hands on a few very exclusive business opportunities. Yet I find myself unable to complete them on my own, which is where you come in. The young looking man said smoothly, like he was talking about the weather or something equally mundane and not fucking nukes. Well, Mr. Ritchie, I don't know what to say. You sure know some dangerous people. Obadiah said nervously. Perhaps, but also some very wealthy people, Mr. Stain. People that can make us rich just the same if we can get them what they want. The blonde bastard said with a light smile as he leaned back. Even if you say that, getting these things will take a lot of work. One doesn't just misplace a nuclear warhead without attracting all types of attention. He tried to explain while imagining just who was attempting to get their hands on these weapons through the Ritchie family. Which is why the option of merely selling some of the parts is there as well. Naturally, the price will be much lower for just the enriched uranium on its own, but Stark does make some powerful alternatives that are acceptable as well. With those words, a long discussion began, which lasted hours before the two men parted ways, both satisfied. Oh, and Mr. Stain, one more thing. I just got my hands on a little something from the Air Force. It is something rather impressive as well, perhaps if young Tony finds himself bored and if you would rather, he didn't go back out to feed those recent rumors. Then perhaps you could send him my Wii? He could spend some time helping my men look it over and trying to understand it. Who knows, he might come back home having learned a thing or two. Obadiah was left alone with those words and couldn't help but remember the news about the Air Force pulling some crazy stunts last month. He was now starting to think that it might have something to do with losing whatever it was that had ended up in Richie's hands. Now the question is whether or not it is worth the risk of sending Tony over to that monster. Dash. Back with Alexander. Alex sat in the back of his car on the way back home after his meeting with Stain. He knew he had spooked the man by trying to get his hands on so many powerful weapons. Right now, the Foundation just didn't have the ability to make its own nuclear weapons. And what kind of foundation would he be running if it wasn't able to throw nukes at all its problems? Sure, it wasn't like he didn't have any, every site had at least one, while more significant sites has more as well, but the amount he could freely use was far too low for his liking. This will put a big drain on the liquid funds available to me, not to mention Ulysses next week, who would have expected that weapons of mass destruction would be so damn expensive. Alex thought as they neared his mansion. He was also tempted to visit Kingpin, but that could wait. That man was still far from as powerful as he would be in the future, and Alex himself was far more powerful than he had assumed at first. Now let's hope Stain comes through on this entire thing, 
A few ready-made nukes would make me feel a lot safer for sure. Alex thought as he looked out the window at the many houses and manners of other rich people here in New York. Once back home, Alex returned to work right away as there was still a bit of time left before dinner, and he was kept busy these days by his many plans. We need more engineers. A lot more. Look into recruiting some good ones. Alex called out to the empty room as he remembered that he had gotten requests from every site for help in building more Quinjets. They really are great crafts. He whispered, as even the drug smuggling operation under him wanted to use the stealth crafts to aid in the rapid expansion. The 50 engineers he had gotten per site wouldn't cut it as all the new sites too requested that treatment. It would be good if Tony were to take me up on my invitation, those crafts are giving even my people some trouble, and getting a better relationship with Tony before he becomes Iron Man will be useful as well. Alex would deny it until his last breath that the real reason he gave out the invitation was just because he wanted to meet his favorite Avenger. Sir, we just got the word from an agent. Tomorrow, Darren Cross will move to remove Hank Byme from Byme Technologies. One of his guards stepped out and informed him. Damn, I just informed them to keep an eye on Pime yesterday, and we already have what we need. Good thing I remembered that it would happen sometime around now, or I would have lost the chance of getting Pime. Alex thought, relieved, as he desperately needed people at that level, not to mention that he would get a whole family of heroes in the future if he played his guards right. As soon as the vote passes, I want Pime to be given an offer he won't be able to forget. I doubt he will accept anything right away, so don't try to force it, just make sure that every morning when he remembers he doesn't have to get up for work, he remembers our offer. Alex ordered quickly and waved the guard away as he went back to his bunker so he could plan how to best make use of Pime. Alex couldn't really remember much about Darren Cross and his stupid plans, which would fail due to a criminal in a borrowed supersuit. Whatever it was, it hardly mattered and wouldn't end up succeeding anyway. Depending on what happens in the future, he might just get rid of him and take over the company as part of the foundation. Pi might like that, getting kicked out and then returning in a huge fashion as the big boss under me. Yeah, let's try and see if that is possible, and I need to make a move on AIM as well. I need someone in there to grab some control over the whole thing quickly. Another day ended with Alex sitting in his secret bunker and scheming like a Bond villain. Chapter 7, The Vibranium Deal Minus 6 Alex was aboard one of the three Quinjets granted to his Site 001 by the system en route to South Africa. His destination, a meeting with the region's most notorious arms dealer, Ulysses Glay. This trip wasn't about acquiring ordinary weapons, which he could easily delegate to a subordinate. Instead, Alex pursued a unique item that Clay had pilfered from some rather secretive individuals. One of his assistants called out, holding out a phone. Sir, a call for you. He couldn't help but raise an eyebrow as he was interrupted from looking over the many reports he had to deal with daily but still taking the phone. It's me. Sir, I'm the agent in charge of dealing with AIM, I request permission to spend 1 billion USD on securing our objective. The voice on the other end stated directly. A billion dollars. Killian's ambition is costly. He's likely nearing a stable extremist prototype, Alex thought. Though calling it stable might be giving him too much credit given the state it was in doing Iron Man 3. Approved. Ensure we embed at least five of our scientists in the project for that amount, he responded after a brief contemplation. Dash. On the other side of the call with Aldrich Killian. Aldrich watched the security footage on his monitor of the hallway right outside his office, where the man had gone to make a call. He was slightly impressed that he couldn't hear anything. Vocal jamming? This is becoming more and more interesting. Barely a moment after the call ended, the man entered the room again. Mr. Killian, my boss has agreed to the amount. He even allowed five of his own scientists to be moved in to help ensure the project succeeds. Aldrich was somewhat surprised at how easily his request for one billion was met. He had been somewhat suspicious when he was informed that some private investor wanted to join AIM, especially so close to the success of Project Extremis. It all felt terribly suspicious, but he also couldn't turn down that amount of money at present. Why, that is great to hear. I don't suppose you can tell me who you work for now, can you? As for the scientists, well, I'm sure I can find somewhere for them in AIM. Aldrich said with a smile on his face. While suspicious, he still enjoyed the idea that someone believed so much in him to spend a full billion like that. I'm afraid my boss wishes to remain anonymous for now, Mr. Killian. Now, shall we get to the signing of the agreements? The man smoothly deflected and tried to move the conversation on. Well, this man might be trained enough not to let things slip, but if he really is sending real scientists, 
There is no way they won't let it slip soon enough, Aldrich thought to himself as they moved on to signing document after document. Aldrich was once again surprised when the person before him signed the transfer for the funds himself rather than needing his mysterious boss to process it. This caused his suspicions to grow and he resolved himself to ensure that those spies didn't reach extremis. Dash. Back with Alex. Alex was just about ready to meet with the infamous weapons dealer. His men were working on security right now, which for a man like him meant combat helicopters in the air with high-caliber machine guns and tank buster rockets as well as a fully armed section of Alpha 1 ready to lie down their lives for him. We will be landing in a few minutes, sir. From there, the meeting will be around 100 meters away from the landing point, an Alpha 1 member said as he stood in full body armor with his gun in hand. While Alex himself was just dressed in his typical suit, which was naturally entirely bulletproof, and his foundation pin on his chest. All right, and remember, we will be getting what we want from this meeting, one way or another. Alex said to remind his men to act appropriately, after all, he didn't want to pay too much, so putting a bit of pressure on Ulysses was expected. The men nodded in understanding as they waited for the craft to land, which happened five minutes later. Afterward, the door opened. All right, let's get some vibranium for the foundation. As Alex stepped outside the craft, he could see his men standing at attention while the sound of his helicopters filled the air and kicked up a strong wind. Not far away, he could see a small group of men dressed very differently from his own guard, standing around and waiting. Mr. Clay, it is a pleasure to meet you, Alex called out as he neared the group, and he could see the man who would one day demand payment from even Ultron. R, Mr. Ritchie. You bring quite an escort with you. One would almost think you were going into war with that much firepower. The man said, clearly on edge by being surrounded by that much firepower. Sure, his own men were around with jeeps, machine guns, and shoulder-mounted rockets, but it felt a little underwhelming compared to what the other man brought. No no, not war Mr. Clay. I am here for the same reason as you, business. Alex said over the noise of the flying deathbringers in the air. Business, you say? The word on the street is that you are pushing hard for expansion right now. A bad time, I dare say, with the Mandarin doing the same and all. Ulysses knew quite a few things about what was going on in the underworld, so he wasn't surprised that Richie wanted weapons, though he didn't believe he had to come all the way down himself to buy them. Well, you let me worry about that, Mr. Clay. I didn't do this without thinking about it first, I can assure you. Now, on to business. I am looking for something special, something I know you have. Something I know you got from your dealings back in the day. Alex said as he used his right hand to tap the back of his neck. The signal wasn't unnoticed by the arms dealer as he tensed up a little. That is some expensive stuff, all right, and very, very rare. Ulysses said slowly while putting an emphasis on just how rare it was. We both know it is nowhere near as rare as those guys claim. I also know just how much of it you really got your hands on a full quarter, didn't you? Alex said with a toothy grin on his lips. I'm only asking for a mere 10 kilograms of it. Ulysses was left very concerned by what he heard the Italian man say. He was just about to open his mouth when all those heavily armed and very well trained looking men of Richie's all tightened the grip of their weapons, which made him reconsider his words. That will cost you a lot, Mr. Richie, and that is with a capital L, he said after a moment. I am ready to pay you one billion for all of it, agree? and I promise that no one will hear a word, nor will any of it enter the market either. Alex made his offer. He knew the reason vibranium was usually so damn expensive was that it was believed to be beyond rare, yet tons and tons of it were hidden by a particular nation, so the real value was not quite as high as many believed. That is a generous offer but not even close to its value, Ulysses responded firmly to the low offer. While a billion dollars was a significant sum, selling vibranium at the average market price could potentially yield tens of times that amount. Please, Mr. Clay, we both know it will take quite a few decades, maybe even lifetimes, to offload your stockpile. Unless you want to flood the market and attract unwanted attention, not only from those pains in the neck but from the rest of the world as well, Alex explained, emphasizing the potential risks. Alex was more than prepared for Ulysses to decline the offer and more than prepared to make him accept it as well. Ulysses grimaced at the mention of drawing attention from Wakandans. You said that none of this would enter the market? Nor would it go to my other buyers? He inquired, swayed by the promise of a billion dollar payday. That's correct, Mr. Clay. I have my own reasons for wanting this. If you sell me what I want, you won't hear or see of it ever again. 
and who knows, I might even return to buy more in the future, helping you turn a few rocks into hard cash and lots of it, Alex replied, attempting to sweeten the deal. He knew that a man like Ulysses Clay was not someone who could be easily threatened into anything without wanting to get back at you. So Alex did his best to ensure Clay would be satisfied. If he couldn't, then he would have to get rough and live up to his name as Overkill. Don't push me, Ulysses, the Foundation wants this or, and what the Foundation wants, it gets. Handle the payment, and I'll have what you want brought out here within the hour, Ulysses agreed after a moment's consideration. He understood that while he was selling his goods below their market value, the alternative risk drawing unwanted attention. I hope the money can be all clean as well, he added cautiously. We'll clean it for you as an after-sale bonus, just this once, though. That way, we can finish this quickly, and both end the day happy, Alex said after a short pause. He turned round and started walking back to his Quinjet. Oh, and Mr. Clay, if you get your hands on some nuclear stuff, let me know, Alex called out as he walked away, leaving Ulysses to sweat over that announcement. An hour later, Alex sat in his Quinjet and played with a small piece of vibranium as he started the trip back home. If a bunch of cowards hiding in their jungle and stealing tech from the rest of the world to improve it with this stuff can be considered the most advanced civilization on Earth, then my foundation can make true marvels with it, Alex mused. He was already anticipating what the foundation might be able to do with the vibranium, though he was worried they would want to target Wakanda to get their hands on all of it. Alex himself had no respect for the nation or its people. He knew the Foundation personnel would have even less, as they greedily hoarded something that could bring prosperity to all of mankind. Stop by Site 644. I want to talk with the top research staff there, and get me some pictures of Howard Stark's Stark Expo and invite Anton Vanko and his son to a site for an interview on the Arc Reactor design, Alex instructed. He suddenly remembered that he didn't have to wait for Tony to come around for these things. If Tony could make it in a cave from scrap, and Ivan could do pretty much the same, then there is no way my people can't create it on their own, much less with Ivan on board as well, he added with a cold voice, fully informing his men what he meant by invitation. Dash. His men didn't understand what he meant by Tony making something in a cave, but neither did they care, they had their orders and that was enough for them. The Quinjet showcased its impressive specs as it arrived at Site 644 in record time. The site itself was only about 60 kilometers from Paris and was currently his main stronghold in Europe. As his jet landed on the roof of what appeared to be the headquarters of a large media company, he saw a group already waiting to greet him. At the front was a bespectacled woman, appearing to be in her mid-50s. She had the look of a respectable businesswoman who had seen everything, fitting for her high-ranking position in the foundation. Welcome to Site 644, sir. I am Site Director Alexandra, and I'm pleased to have you here, she said, quickly leading Alex and his guards into the depths of the facility, where a large group of researchers greeted them. Alexandra? That means Defender of Mankind, doesn't it? A fine name indeed, Director, Alex said lightly, knowing well about her name as his own meant the same while riding the elevator and offering the woman a light smile. Well, it is what we do, sir. I have sent out one of those new Quinjets to bring in that further and sun pair you requested. They should get here soon enough. And if I may, those jets are a real marvel, or so my men keep saying. Having more of those would be a blessing, the woman said, making a barely veiled request for more jets. Alex didn't bother answering it as he simply didn't have more to give. Even Shield was still working on making their first working ones. The rest of the day went on with Alex handing over two kilograms of vibranium to the researchers and telling them what he knew about the metal, as well as informing them about Wakanda and Tolokan, which he named as an SCP. He also hinted about the possibility of relics made of stuff that might have leaked out into museums around the world. He finished by telling them about the high-energy element found by Stark and that the father and son duo would have designs for a reactor that was meant to harness that power. Dash returning home, he felt like he had accomplished a lot over the past few days, such as buying vibranium, getting into AIM, and obtaining the arc reactor. He looked forward to seeing what his people could do with vibranium, the reactor, and the new element. The staff back at Site 644 had been really excited to get started on it, so he expected some results soon enough. That site might not be one with a focus on science, but that didn't mean that they didn't have a large amount of bright minds around. Alex still hoped to get a proper foundation science research site soon. For the glory of humanity, he said as he stood up and emptied his wine glass before leaving his spot by the pool and heading to bed. Behind him, 
his men saluted in the shadows and repeated his words. Chapter 8 The Shadow of SCP-169-7 Alex barely noticed time slipping by as he plunged into a whirlwind of work. His involvement with the Foundation had escalated to an all-time high as they managed to secure an impressive array of SCPs, a feat that should have been less surprising to him. The legends of curses and hauntings they pursued often bore fruit, leading to unexpected discoveries. Alex had finally gotten his first Euclid SCP placed in containment due to the tireless efforts of the Foundation personnel. Sadly, all he got was 1,000 system points and not any other rewards. Still, it had allowed him not to have to worry about points for the monthly summoning, so he was satisfied enough. This development had an added benefit, the Foundation agents were now thoroughly engaged in meaningful tasks, significantly reducing the number of trivial requests that typically flooded in. However, Alex observed an uptick in requests for interventions in Wakanda, driven by the increasing allure of Vibranium's potential. Amidst this flurry of activity, Alex found himself almost looking forward to the next SCP he would summon, contemplating the rewards it could bring. His attention to SCP-169, the sleeping Leviathan, had waned since there was little he could do, other than financially support its containment. Not that the system considered it properly contained, after all, all he could do was send some ships down and keep an eye out for anything that might spell trouble. Elsewhere, the giant creature was far from forgotten. Kamartage. The tranquil atmosphere of Kamartage had been disrupted ever since the Ancient One began displaying signs of agitation. This unusual behavior had sent ripples of unease throughout the temple, sparking whispered conversations among the masters. My friend, what has everyone acting so tense all the time? A master of the mystic arts who had been away for a time asked a friend. Ah yeah, you have been busy with the situation in China, haven't you? Well, if you spend any time here now, you will surely notice it. The ancient one has been spooked, the friend said in a low voice. I saw her in the library when I got here, she seemed so busy I didn't dare to disturb her, the first master said in a low voice of his own. Indeed, she has been acting like that for the past few weeks. At first, no one dared to ask her any questions. It wasn't until Master Kiesolas asked her that the rest of us found out what was going on, the other master said in hushed tones. And what did Master Kiesolas say had worried the Supreme One? The master asked, filled with curiosity. Well. Right after speaking with the Supreme One, Master Kiesilius left the temple. He returned, clearly disturbed. It was then the rest of us learned what had happened. You see, it appears that the Ancient One was suddenly alerted to the appearance of a huge life signature. When she went to check it out, she discovered an impossibly huge creature sleeping at the bottom of the sea. Which sea? The other master interrupted. Not just one, my dear friend. That is what is so frightening. The creature is so huge it spans from the Atlantic to the Pacific. As I said, the creature is impossibly large in size. There is no way it just appeared. It must have been there for millions of years, but it went unnoticed until a few weeks ago. Now everyone is trying to find out who hid the creature and how they did it, the master said, not letting the interruption bother him. So, this creature has scared everyone? The master asked, clearly not yet understanding the size of the unknown creature. Well, naturally, everyone is worried. As I said, the creature is sleeping, but should it wake up and move just a little bit, it will cause countless amounts of life to be lost, possibly destroying entire continents without meaning to, the master said, trying to help his friend understand the horror of this behemoth. That, that is a scary thought. But it is sleeping, yes? The tone of the first master had now grown more worried and the volume lower. Yes, and I'm sure many masters are looking for ways to ensure it doesn't wake up either, the master said, casting a look towards the library where both the Ancient One and the most senior masters were buried in old tomes. And here I thought we had enough to worry about with creatures from other dimensions trying to enter into ours. Yet now we also have to deal with something like that. I don't envy the Supreme One, the burden on her shoulders must truly be immense. The two masters continued to discuss it in hushed whispers, and all around the place, other members of Kamartaj did the same. The sudden appearance of SCP-169 had truly made everyone feel worried, rightfully so as well, since it was a dangerous Skeeter Class 1, which could cause a Cake Class event. Talokan. At the bottom of the sea lay Talokan, a city glittering with a brilliant luster, home to the Talokan Ill, a near-human species adorned with blue skin and gills. Having long forsaken the surface world, they now reigned supreme under the waves, their resentment towards humans slowly growing as their waters became increasingly polluted. 
Inside a resplendent building, King Neymar engaged in earnest conversation with one of his advisers. The subject of their discourse was evident, observable through the large windows of the chamber. SCP-169, also known as the Leviathan, loomed ominously in their midst, though they would not recognize it by that name. My king, did you learn anything from the surface dwellers? The advisor asked with a tired voice, having been unable to get proper rest since the appearance of the creature. They don't seem to know that it is even there, much less what it is or how it came to be there, Neymar replied, his tone fatigued. But my king, this leviathan couldn't simply have appeared out of thin water. Our kingdom has been here for many years. We have ruled the seas for generations, and now our people are afraid to even sleep in their own beds. The advisor exclaimed, desperately seeking answers. Don't you think I know that? But it really seems like it appeared out of thin water. Look at its size, then look at our city. Our home should be in ruins from the displacement of water caused by that thing appearing. The surface should be destroyed by rising sea levels. Yet, neither of those things happened. Name accounted, his weariness evident. But what should we do, my king? The beast can't be allowed to stay there. We wouldn't be able to rest easy with it so close to us, the advisor implored. Nothing. We will do nothing because we can't do anything. The creature is sleeping right now, and it's the only reason our kingdom is still intact. Should it wake up and move, we would be doomed. No, we have ruled the seas for a long time, now we must simply accept that we are not its true masters, Neymar declared, his voice filling the chamber with resolve. But what are the people? What do we tell them? They are worried. They can't rest or stay calm. The whole kingdom is in chaos even as we speak, the advisor protested, his voice shaking. Tell them that it is a new guardian god of our kingdom. Tell them that it will do us no harm as long as we don't disturb its sleep, and let us pray it never wakes up. And let's continue to monitor the area around it to see if it has any harmful effects on the ocean, Neymar instructed after a long pause and with a heavy heart. Yes, my king. I know you don't like the answer, but the truth is that we have no answer, and we have no solution, Neymar conceded. He liked it no more than his advisor did, but he truly had nothing more to offer. Even if his power to control sea life worked on it, the creature only needed a single moment while awake to move its body, and his kingdom would be gone. He didn't dare gamble on his voice working before that happened, never mind if his voice have no effect. For now, it was sleeping, so let it sleep, and hope it never wakes up. Dash. S-H-I-L-D. The one-eyed pirate and the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury, stood in his office with one of his most trusted agents, Maria Hill. What is this I have heard about some sea routes being closed off? He asked. Well, sir, it seems to be a non-profit organization called the Nature Preservation Foundation. They have declared that some rare and unique type of ocean ecosystem there is threatened. They have used huge amounts of money to push for the area to be spared just about any type of human intervention. Shipping lanes, military routes, and everything else have been cut out. All with the power of money and public support from other organizations like Greenpeace. And what is the truth? Nick Fury wasn't stupid enough to think that something like some stupid underwater seaweed would be able to raise enough money and political power to get a blockade of this size to happen unless there was some secret behind it. The truth, sir, seems to be that the Ritchie family is using the whole thing as another way to launder money and protect a shipping route for drugs. As some ships still travel the area and those are all Ritchie ships, Hill said, having already made sure to find out the whole truth before coming to report anything to her boss. The Ritchie family seems to be working hard on expanding, very hard indeed. This is already the eighth time I've heard that name this week. Do we know why? Fury said, pondering all he knew about this crime family. We are not entirely sure yet, boss. They are so active that our spies are having trouble keeping up. But they seem to be trying hard to get in touch with the Ten Rings. So it seems that it is something to do with them, Hill said, a bit more unsure as there were still a lot of questions surrounding the Ritchie family's recent actions. Keep an eye on them then. We can ignore their drug smuggling and money laundering since they have so much support from above. But if they start working with terrorists, we might have to get involved, Fury said after a moment, countless plans for dealing with the Ritchie family flashing through his mind momentarily before letting it drop. Yes, sir. I will have our men keep an eye out for anything and figure out what they want with the Ten Rings, Hill said as she finished up her report and put the matter in the back of her mind, deeming it mostly unimportant. Dash. Saito 01. While the world slowly reacted to his actions, Alex himself sat in his bunker, adding names to the long list of people and organizations he wanted to keep an eye on at all times.
Joseph and Lucy Bauer. Bruce Banner. Peter Parker. Norman Osborn. Morgan Le Fay. Pride. Agatha Harkness. Dr. Stephen Vincent Strange. Wanda Maximoff. Daniel Whitehall, a.k.a. Werner Reinhardt. Natasha Romanoff. Anthony Edward Stark. Kevin Thompson. Jessica Jones. Mark Spector. Arthur Harrow. Helen Cho. Cersei. Jill Gay Mesh. Ajak. Icaris. Agna. Kingo. Spite. Fastos. Makari. Druig. The list was filled with names that Alex remembered from before his move into this world, though many of those names he had little idea of who there truly was. He knew that some of them was connected to the Darkhold, which was enough to earn his attention. Other names were added simply so he could stay updated on important events. Norman Osborn had been a rather unpleasant surprise, as it wasn't one he had expected to see in this world. Yet clearly there were some differences between this world and the canon MCU. What these differences was, he didn't know. However it did mean he had to be on guard for the unexpected. Still, the list before him was filled with people who could come across an SCP or were SCPs themselves. If he acted in time, he could prevent quite a few near XK class events without relying on some contrived plot to save the day. Furthermore, many of them could potentially be valuable assets for him and the Foundation without alerting the Ancient One. He truly desired to acquire the Tesseract but feared that doing so would draw her wrath upon him. Additionally, he wanted to ensure he could contain it in a way that Loki wouldn't be able to manipulate it. For now, he focused on smaller tasks. However, as he looked at the list, he couldn't help but mourn the time he would have to spend writing up SCP files for many of them. Far too many were simply too dangerous to confront without any knowledge of their abilities, and he didn't want to risk either sacrificing his agents or alerting the anomalies. Chapter 9, The Mandarin, Finally Minus 8 Now I know that in the film when Wu mocks the name he was given by the West, he does, however, use that in the comics, so the using of that name is part of my AU. After far too long, Alex finally had a chance to speak with SCP-10000. The Mandarin, Xuan Wu himself. Alex had been just about ready to send one of the Foundation's valuable nukes down at him to get his attention. Alex, as the leader of the Foundation, had gotten used to being in charge over the past two months. Waiting weeks to talk with someone didn't make him happy at all. Even more so when all he got was a damned phone call with him as well. The Mandarin, it sure has been difficult to get a chance to talk with you, Mr. Xu, Alex said as the phone connected while leaning back in his office at Site 001. Mr. Ritchie. Your persistent efforts to reach me have been noted, Xu's voice came through, devoid of humor. I am occupied these days. Be direct, and do not squander my time. Fine, Mr. Xu, if that is what you want. I wanted to speak with you about your return in the revival of the Ten Rings. I was of the understanding that you had retired to be with your family. Alex said slowly while tapping his fingers against his desk. Don't bring up my family, Xu hissed angrily on the other side of the phone. If you must know, then I am out for revenge, as long as you don't get in my way, Richie, then we will have no problems. Revenge? Who in this world is foolish enough to cross you of all people so badly you would come out of retirement? Alex pretended that he knew nothing, and while he indeed didn't remember who killed his wife, he at least knew it had happened. If you must know Mr. Richie, then someone dared to kill my beloved wife, and I will not rest until I have had my revenge. Xu snapped back angrily. Alex glanced down at his desk, where the files for SCP-10252 and SCP-10254 lay in two small paper folders. He had planned to sell these to Xu, but since the man didn't even want to meet him face to face, Alex decided to raise the price a bit. Allow me to offer my condolences for your wife's passing, Mr. Xu. I only ever met her once, but that was enough for me to know she was a truly good person. Alex started his final plan with those words. I would like to offer my help, but alas, while I can do much to prevent someone from dying, bringing them back is beyond what I can do. He continued smoothly. Why are you suddenly talking about bringing my wife back? I just said I wanted revenge. Even if she were brought back, I would not stop, Xu asked, his voice edged with suspicion. Well, you keep saying you want revenge, and if someone took something from me, well, Let's just say my revenge would not be complete before I stood with what they took back in my arms and them all lying dead and broken before me, Alex replied, leading Xu down a different path than he had walked in his movie. So, what would the famous overkill do if someone killed the love of your life? Xu asked, now somewhat calmed down. Well, 
I think the only proper revenge is when you lose nothing and they lose everything. So, I guess I would find a way to bring my love back to me. While most would think something like that impossible, they would also think an ancient warlord still being alive today as impossible. But we both know better, Alex continued to string him along, now that he had him hooked. You know something, Richie, I can hear it in your voice, the Mandarin shot back. I didn't lie when I said I didn't have a way to bring someone back. But I hear things, rumors, and the like. There are two rumors I have heard that might be able to give you what you want, he said, cleanly loading his words with hints. Not mere rumors, I would assume, since you dare bring it up with me. What do you want for this information you have, Mr. Ritchie? The Mandarin said as he bit down on the bait willingly. From there, the conversation went on and on as they started talking business, and Alex did his best to balance his greed with shrewdness. Still, when he finally put the phone down hours later, he had gotten a lot from the old warlord. With this, China will more or less be mine. The Foundation should be able to replace S.H.I.E.L.D. there rather quickly. Now I just need to wait and pretend I'm looking into those clues for a bit longer, and then I can meet him for a handover, Alex thought as he placed the files inside a safe and left to have some dinner. Tomorrow, I will summon yet another SCP. Maybe I should look up some lucky rituals? Nah, given my luck, some SCP will be involved with that, and my ritual would just mean I would summon them tomorrow. Alex walked with a spring in his step as he was both excited and terrified about what could happen tomorrow. Dash. System, summon the monthly required SCP to meet the minimum, Alex said as he sat in his bunker right after having finished his breakfast. Ding. Understood, host, please stand by as the random SCP is summoned. Ding. Warning. Host, an SCP, has appeared in the world and is outside Foundation control. Host is asked to deal with the situation and follow the Foundation's goal of securing, containing, and protecting. Ding. Warning. SCP-1555 has appeared. HMM. Alright, this one is doable, I guess. However, again, it is not something that can be placed in a containment cell. So it will be interesting to see if just putting up some signs and a fence or two will be enough, Alex thought after going over the information he had on this SCP object. Though I guess I can use this SCP for a few of my plans, Alex whispered as he leaned back to make plans before his system once again interrupted him. Ding. Congratulations, host, for meeting the SCP requirement for three months in a row. Host has been rewarded with an additional SCP free random spawn from the system. Wait, wait. No, no, I don't need that reward. Alex tried to stop his system, but it didn't listen. Ding. Warning. SCP-391 has appeared. Alex nearly collapsed in relief when he learned that it was a safe class SCP that had been summoned. Letting go of the breath he didn't know he had been holding, he used his system to locate the two rogue SCPs while the system went on about rewards. Ding. Congratulations to host for getting Site-130, a Class 3 Foundation facility in Russia. 500 Class C combat personnel, 50 research personnel, 100 administrative personnel, and 30 maintenance personnel. Ding. Congratulations to host for getting 1,000 undercover Foundation agents within the USA. Ding. Congratulations to host for getting one special containment task force of 25 Class A combat personnel. <laughs> more undercover agents are nice. But I need way more than that. Still, to think SCP-391 would end up there. Guess I better send someone to get it quickly. He decided and quickly gave the orders for someone to move to Camp Lehigh to follow up on a clue about a possible SCP object there. He figured he could just send them to capture all owls in the area alive, and then they could take their time. Now for SCP-1555, I should get that done before looking into meeting Bruce. It's time I collect my first Avenger, Alex whispered to himself as he could finally start his plan to make his own Alpha-9 strike force within the Foundation. If only that darn SCP locator tool would work. I mean, really, what is the point of telling me that 1555 is in the US? Where else would it be? Alex cursed in his mind how evil his system was. Not only did it suddenly come out and double the chance for a death SCP to spawn, but it gave nearly no help. Dash. It was two days later, during one of his daily meetings, that Alex heard the ping of the system ring out in his mind. Ding. Congratulations to host for the successful containment of SCP-391. Rewards are being given out. Ding. Host has been rewarded with Midas Touch Half. Please continue to work for the Foundation. Alex couldn't help but raise an eyebrow at that reward. Half of Midas touch? 
What is that? System, explain the reward, he whispered under his breath. Ding. Midas touch allows host to turn objects he is touching into gold. Host only has half of the Midas touch and therefore can't transform anything to gold yet. So a totally pointless reward which has no use. Great. These rewards made no sense yet. So far, I have only gotten more additions to the foundation, and now it's personal power? Though I got to admit, the full reward would be sweet. Alex really did like the idea of getting his hands on his first superpower. However, having half didn't do him any good. I guess I need another Midas SCP for the whole reward? Is there even such an SCP? The meeting is over. I want a report on Banner and a drip made ready to San Juan for any time I need it. Alex said, cutting the meeting short as he turned and left the room, leaving behind the sounds of people saluting and crying out, Yes, sir. Dash. Welcome to Site 014, sir, the site director said as Alex stepped off the Quinjet. I hope I didn't take you away from your work, director, Alex replied politely as he was led inside what looked like a large office building with its very own warehouse next to it. Only the warehouse was, in fact, the vehicle bay. So tell me about this new safe class SCP you have, Director, Alex said as they walked along the halls of the site while nodding to the many members of staff. Well, so far, we believe that it's SCP-391, also known as Midas Owl. Which I assume you already had guessed based on the fact you asked us to capture all owls in the area, the woman said as she led Alex down to a containment cell. Indeed, my sources did suspect that it was SCP-391 that had made a reappearance. Still, given the situation we are in, it's best to be extra cautious. Now, did retrieving 391 come with any difficulties? With the area it showed up in being watched to my shield's Hydra division? Not as much as we had feared, sir. We got some proper paperwork done, which should allow us in, and I suspect they didn't want to make a show out of refusing us. They did demand to watch our men do their work, but that was no problem, the woman said as they stood before a large glass window into the containment cell. That's good, we wouldn't want S.H.I.E.L.D. to get in the way of the Foundation's work. While they try to protect humanity in their own way, they can't be trusted with something so important. Only we can, Alex said, not forgetting to enhance the glory of his Foundation in the minds of the other people in the room. Right, you are, sir. They have their own thoughts and ideas, they are not suited to handle SCP cases like we do, the woman agreed, as she knew a lot about S.H.I.E.L.D. as a Class 4 employee of the Foundation. The more she knew about them, the less she liked the organization that pretended to be like their foundation. But enough about that. Instead, I want to talk about 391. I want you to figure out how much gold it can produce and its worth. You are then to sell it through agents within the Ritchie family. The proceeds will be added to this site, though it won't reduce the funds granted from headquarters. Still, it is important to keep the accounts clean and clear. Understood? Alex said after thinking for a moment. He knew that the amount of gold would not be that much. So, there was no point in taking the SCP object back to Site 001. Better to just let it stay here and increase the money this site has so he wouldn't need to increase the budget too much as they got hold of more SCPs. The director naturally agreed that she didn't have a choice and wouldn't go about turning down extra funds as even though there weren't yet many SCPs in containment, the hunt for them still cost a lot of money. After spending the rest of the day at Site 014, Alex bid farewell and returned back to his home to rest. Tomorrow, we will set off for San Juan. He told his guards so they could prepare everything as he entered his quarters for the night. While Alexander Ritchie was having a meeting with the staff at Site 014, another Alexander was hearing a report that had quite a few similarities with the one Alex heard. Dash. So someone wanted to poke around at Camp Lehigh? Alexander Pierce asked on the phone. He, as the head of Hydra, knew that while most of S.H.I.E.L.D. had mostly abandoned the place, Hydra still had some secrets buried there. Yes, sir. It was animal control, sir. They had the proper paperwork to get access to the place, so we couldn't stop them without a good reason. Even then, it would surely have raised questions about why we cared so much for what is supposed to be an abandoned site, the agent on the other end of the call said. We were able to shadow them as they worked on capturing all owls they could find. They did spend a bit of time looking at the bottom of trees for traces of more owls but did nothing suspicious. It seemed that it was just a legit search for owls without anything else. <laughs> well done for keeping this under wraps for now. I expect you to follow up and ensure nothing else was done or left behind by them. As long as you find nothing, then don't bother reporting it, Pierce said after a short pause as he came to the conclusion that nothing was off about it. 
given the order to capture Rowles was legit and apparently because there were sign of bird flu. Understood, sir. Hail Hydra. Hail Hydra. Chapter 10, Inhuman Clue Minus 9. It was a beautiful morning in New York. People were going about their business and hurrying to work and school all around. The city was buzzing with sound and life. Truly, this place was the beating heart of the modern world. In the affluent area of town, nestled within a grand mansion, lived a young, handsome Italian man. The mansion was abuzz with activity, including the distinct sound of a sleek, black, high-tech stealth jet taking off. Their destination was San Juan, where Alex intended to oversee containment efforts for a significant SCP. This endeavor piqued Alex's interest, as containing such a dangerous anomaly in total secrecy presented a formidable challenge. As they touched down, Alex was escorted to an unassuming house that had been converted into a Class II facility. Welcome to the temporary site 12555, sir. The man in charge said as Alex stepped foot into the building. The SCP here is dangerous, sir. Due to this, there are certain precautions you need to be made aware of. First, you are not allowed to enter into SCP-12555 yourself. It is simply too dangerous. The man said both towards Alex and his guards, who all that nodded. Secondly, only Foundation personnel with a security clearance of level 2 or lower are permitted near SCP-12555. And thirdly, no advanced foundation equipment is allowed inside, the man explained, leading them to a room filled with monitoring equipment and diagrams. As you're likely aware, SCP-12555 is an underground city of unknown origin exhibiting anomalous properties. Given its underwater location and limited entry points, gaining access to the city was challenging. However, by using powerful drilling equipment we were able to create an entrance. Alex examined the maps and pictures displayed during the briefing, nodding slowly as he absorbed the information. He harbored a keen interest in understanding the inner workings of the Foundation. While he could access the finished product through the database provided by the system, he also desired insight into the process leading to that point. After establishing entry, our primary focus was on securing the object and mapping out the interior. This task presented challenges, particularly due to the large size of the object, meaning that it's entirely possible that other entrances exist the man continued. Alex was well aware of the potential difficulties with this SCP object, after all not only was the size and scale massive, but so too did it just happen to sit under a city, meaning that all work had to be done in total secrecy. Once more, Alex was reminded of the critical need for additional undercover agents. Do I truly need to recruit agents independently? Acquiring the allegiance of low-level individuals will undoubtedly be costly. Training high-level operatives from the ground up seems inevitable. The temptation to summon more SCPs to bolster Foundation personnel grew within him once again. However, he recognized the inherent risks associated with such actions. Some SCP objects might require more personnel than he could secure through summoning, not to mention the inherent dangers involved. After establishing the outer perimeter, we arranged for the shipment of equipment and personnel, including a contingent of Class D personnel, generously permitted for our use. Our initial efforts involved deploying probes and surveillance equipment into the area, the man concluded. All attempts using electronic equipment proved futile, as the SCP interfered with all such devices, the man explained, presenting a detailed list of tests and equipment used in those failed attempts. Subsequently, we had to rely on Class D personnel, which presented additional challenges since we couldn't utilize remote-controlled explosive collars for control. Nonetheless, we adapted, resorting to firearms, which proved effective, he continued, a slight smirk playing on his lips. Alex couldn't help but think that such an approach was dangerous, after all unless they sent in guards armed with those guns, the only way they could have used them was from the top of the entrance. Should there be another exit somewhere? It was entirely possible that the D-Class would be able to escape with knowledge of the Foundation. Yet he didn't interrupt, willing to find out the details before taking any actions himself. The initial group of Class D subjects we sent in didn't last long. Within moments, we heard loud screams and promptly retrieved them from the hole, he pointed to a monitor displaying a large, deep cavity sealed with a thick steel lid. Of the initial five, three became unresponsive, screaming as if in extreme agony. After a brief period, the screams ceased, and their eyes turned a deep red, the man explained, displaying images of individuals clad in the classic orange jumpsuits with crimson eyes. Following the cessation of their screams, they became aggressive and unresponsive, we classified these as SCP-12555-1. 
these individuals appear to have lost their sanity while gaining heightened strength and endurance. We are currently investigating the extent of these enhancements, he elaborated, handing over a file containing documentation of what could only be described as inhumane experiments for Alex to review. We dispatched several instances of SCP-12555-1 to Site-014, the facility overseeing operations here. Fortunately, the remaining two Class D personnel helped us establish a correlation between contact with SCP-12555's interior and the transformation into SCP-12555-1 instances. Five additional Class D personnel were lost in verifying this correlation, he continued, detailing the process further. Alex made note of the distance between this location and Site-014, highlighting the lack of facilities in the area. After any level of contact with SCP-12555, ranging from a fingertip to exposure of over 30% of the body, subjects experienced intense pain lasting precisely 1 minute and 27 seconds before undergoing a complete transformation, the man concluded, leaving Alex increasingly impressed with the Foundation's meticulous approach to containment. All instances were subsequently terminated and transferred to Site-014 for further analysis. Following this, a new group of D-Class personnel was dispatched to map and explore the area. The man continued, presenting a series of maps to Alex, some of which were rudimentary while others showed significant improvement. It took considerable time to fully explore the entire exterior, and we installed chemically powered lights to illuminate the structure. We also delineated it into an outer and inner section. However, exploring the inner portion proved challenging, as all D-Class personnel perished upon crossing the threshold, he explained, acknowledging the limitations faced. While we cannot claim to have entirely mapped the outer region due to certain areas remaining submerged, we are reasonably confident in our understanding of the general layout, he added. Now, regarding the inner area, our inability to deploy personnel or remote-controlled equipment limited our exploration. Instead, we resorted to throwing flares and utilizing binoculars for observation. The inner chamber comprises a single large room with a central semi-structure, featuring a raised platform or altar, which appears to be empty, he described, outlining their efforts to study the site despite the challenges. Given the constraints, we redirected our attention to studying the outer area comprehensively and delving into the mechanics behind SCP-12555-1 instances. We allowed for the formation of an additional three instances using D-Class personnel, leaving them within the structure for observation, he concluded, highlighting their adaptive approach to research and containment. They would stand still or move to patrol the area. We believe they are turning into a form of guards for SCP-12555. They will attack anyone entering unless they begin the transformation. Alex nodded along as he listened carefully while looking at the provided material in the form of pictures and video taken from outside the SCP, showing the area immediately inside the opening. Now, one of the most interesting finds we had during this period of testing was that a single member of D-Class was not attacked by instances of SCP-12555-1, he said, sliding a folder containing the information about this D-Class, a Mexican woman who kidnapped children and sold them off. Furthermore, this D-Class had the ability to order the instances around to a limited degree. She did attempt to use this to escape Foundation control, but we dealt with all the SCP-12555-1 instances and moved to confine the D-Class, now assigned as SCP-12555-2. We didn't want to risk her by using her to check if she could enter the inner part. Instead, we sent her to Site-014 for a thorough examination to find out what made her unique. Results on that are currently pending. So we are currently waiting for that report before we continue with tests. If possible, we would next try to identify more instances of SCP-12555-2 to test out if they can enter the inner part. Alex leaned back and nodded his head as the report came to an end. He knew that the woman must have an inhuman gene, which is why that happened. He was also both surprised and happy that an inhuman had been found doing this, since it would push the research further along. How close are we to being able to declare this SCP contained? I'm prepared to allow for a Class 2 site to be built here in San Juan, even a Class 3 if needed. With the SCP object seemingly being this dangerous and being so close to a major population center, I want this dealt with properly, Alex finally said after a short pause to think. Well, that depends on a few things, sir. The results of the tests done on the one member of D-Class. We also don't know if there are any clues out there leading to the location of SCP-12555 that others might follow. 
a class 2 facility should do for now. As long as the results are not too dire, we should be able to have the SCP declared as contained Euclid class in a month. Alex could accept that time frame and promise to authorize the needed equipment and manpower to be transferred over and for Site 12555 to become operational, though he might assign a different number for the permanent site. Alex would have liked to spend the rest of the week in San Juan, seeing the sites and having a short vacation, but he simply had too much work to do to be able to do it. Just coming all the way down here to see the Cree city in person and get the report in person had been a frivolous use of time. Yet one he had willingly accepted due to his own desires, still, he did know that he couldn't continue acting like that for now, so, with that being the case, he quickly returned back home as soon as his meeting was over. Dash. Back home in New York. He took the chance to set up a few meetings. One was with Norman Osborn, and the other was with Tony Stark. With Tony, all he could do was send a message proposing a challenge to the genius, hoping he would accept. Alex desired a way to bring technologies down into the Cree city, so he needed some kind of shielding. He presented it to them as a unique underground chamber where the metallic composition of the walls would create an EMP field when introduced to a current. Such shielding could come in handy in many cases, he mused and I remember that many smart people would come out of Oscorp, so getting a chance to recruit them might be good as well. Not to mention more advanced tech is needed in the future as more SCPs come over. He spent most of his time either working on the Ritchie family or the Foundation. When not, he would plan for the future. It was easy to get ahead of himself, and he often had to slow down. Acting too fast could be dangerous. Shield is out there and watching. Plans had been drawn up and scrapped again and again as the timing was off or the objective would be more successful if he waited longer. There were so many people he wanted to meet and bring into the foundation, yet doing so was damn difficult since they were all occupied with other endeavors, under the watchful eye of S.H.I.E.L.D., or simply hesitant to join a shady super-organization. Still, he refused to believe that the nearly almighty foundation, which could acquire and contain gods, couldn't recruit a few arrogant scientists and researchers as well. It was all a matter of time, and having enough SCPs in containment that he could use to demonstrate the value the Foundation brought to humanity would be helpful. Still, SCP-1555 should be enough to persuade Banner to come on board. He wouldn't need much proof as long as I promise him a better life than he has now, which should be easy since he is on the run and offer him a chance to work on curing the Hulk. Though I need him to fail there. The Hulk is important for the future. Yeah. The Hulk will remain, but I can bring him and Banner closer so we won't have problems. Not to mention, it should count as at least an Euclid-class SCP being contained, Alex mused to himself as he slowly left his bunker after finishing his work. Poor Bruce Banner had no idea that his already chaotic life would soon undergo a huge change as a new person schemed to get his hands on him.